Tobias, thank you for joining us today on Better Business with Magic. You have a long history with performing, directing in Vegas, in New York. You've written books on this topic. So there's so much I want to talk to you about. And I guess the only place that I can know where to start with and begin is from the beginning point of a business. And a lot of times businesses, they're you know, in the startup phases, they have one or two employees, they're looking to grow, they're looking to get their business out, they're looking to get their vision out. So what advice would you have for a young business, young startup that's trying to get their message across and get that hook in so people are interested in their business? I always like to start with know what your business is for. If you can... You know, all, all these big corporations have what, what they call a mission statement. And if you read the mission statement for General Mills and the mission statement for Exxon, they look the same. We are dedicated to excellence in building community and this and that. Exxon's never says, we drill oil and sell it. General Mills never says, we produce healthy, good f economical food. They have all this junk in their mission statement. And a really successful mission statement, purpose, can guide every decision the company makes. I, I think Ben and Jerry's has a good one, where, where they, they want to do, they, they love ice cream and they love the community that creates around ice cream and they want to serve that community. And in order to serve the community in the ways they want to, they need to make a profit by selling ice cream. That's their mission. And that tells you everything you, know, you need to know about Ben and Jerry's business. It's like, we are going to produce ice cream. We're going to do it in this way with this kind of people. And you might pay a little extra for our ice cream because you're supporting the causes that we support. And that's enough. You know, yeah. it, it distinguishes it, them. Yeah, in, in business school, I learned that there's a mission statement and a vision statement. The mission statement is what we do. The vision statement is why we do it. And mm -hmm. a lot of businesses don't really understand their why or know how to articulate their why. And a lot of times that why is their story that they can sell to the public and to their customer that keeps them coming back. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, there's, there's a great TED Talk by Simon Sinek um, about why. They buy the why. They don't care what you do. They buy why you do it. I mean, they do care about what you do, but you know, it's it's. But we'll buy from someone that we like. So this is what branding's all about. This is the reason if you have a great brand, you can charge a little bit more than the mm -hmm. generic brand because we trust you. We know why you do this. We, you're our kind of people, and uh, that you know that you go back to the mission and the vision, and it's the same thing. Who is the market that you want to serve? And because uh, it's, it's different for all of us. You know, Mercedes isn't terribly interested in serving the same market that Volvo or that um, Nissan does. Their, their markets have different concerns and different expectations. And yeah, so uh, that, the, all of that becomes part of who am I serving? What is their pain? How am I solving it? All those things go into that mission statement. And then your business model, which mm -hmm. is can often be separate from your mission. You know, Google's mission vision is we want to catalog all, all basically all the information in the universe and make it accessible. Yeah, they don't make one, money doing that. They make money selling ads. And, very true. Which, which is okay because the information they get from you getting information from them is information about you and you know they're selling attention basically the world comes to us to learn about things you want to know what they want to learn about we can put your ad next to what this guy wants to learn about he wants to learn about i don't know better medicine for some disease well somebody out there is selling better medicine for that kind of disease and when the search comes up we can put your ad in front of them and that's their business model, but it's not really their their mission. Mm -hmm. So it's and important to know both. Whenever we talk of, of Google and Mercedes and we bring up the big companies like Apple and Nike, the thing that I'm drawn to is their origin story. 
they have this underdog story to them that most people in business understand. You know, Google and their colors with the Legos and Nike and the waffle maker selling shoes out of the trunk of their car. Yeah. You no, know, and Apple, everybody knows the, these stories. And I think customers are drawn to this, this underdog story to where if, if you're an investor or just a startup and your story is, I had an idea and I developed an app. It's right. going to fall flat on your customers, but Absolutely. being able to to find a story to to get to the customers to say, "Hey, we had this idea. There was this problem. There was a struggle. We went twelve months sleeping mm-hmm. in our parents' basement on the same sheets just so we could code all night long to have all these issues, all these troubles, and be able to tell that into a story right. that people are drawn to." Yeah. So with that whole story concept and what customers seem to be drawn to, how would you help a company develop their story besides just taking the facts of their past as far as developing an actual story to tell to their customers? Um, I actually have a, a process that, that I take people through in my workshops. And it is, you start out with, with that mission, vision, who's your market, and then you develop the things any salesman would develop. You say, what are the features of my business that serve this market? And what did the each feature turned into a benefit for the person buying the, using the service, whatever it is. Mm. And what is different? Well, what's what's unique about my service? What what's special about it? What how do I solve something that nobody else is solving? And or in this way, what's new? What's different? And I look at all that information together mm-hmm. and say, okay, let's, let's start figuring out what the story is. Is the story my company story? Is it the story about someone who used the product? Is it the story about the founder? Because most, most big businesses, the, the CEO controls the mm-hmm. message of the business. They are the brand. Think of Richard Branson. Um, or you know any of them, Steve Jobs, whoever, and uh, and it changes if you get a different person there. But whose story is this? And it's a little different for different companies. And what's the best story we can come up with for the pain that's resolved? So you know, my 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 poor little dog was, you know infested with fleas and he was wasting away and such and such and i love the little dog so much but i i I was afraid we were going to have to have have him put down and uh, you know and and here's a picture of how awful the little dog looked and he was just suffering the only kind thing but then i discovered that by the simple process of giving him sesame oil and such and such and this indian doctor came and told me and we tried it and this is what the dog looks like today. So we took all the knowledge that that Indian such and such, and we put it into this regimen. Mm-hmm. And now you've got a story of a little dog that tugs at the heartstrings and does such and such. I'm selling cod liver oil, but that's not what, you know. So, so with that, let's go into to what magicians would call misdirection, which is more appropriately called directing attention. Yeah. So if you are selling another product that's on the market how do you direct the attention to your product to make it stand out when there are other kind of things out there well it has to be it has to be cheaper or better or totally unique and work in a different way i i, I think it's almost one of those three and uh yeah in, in marketing there's there's three types of products there's evolutionary mm-hmm. uh, revolutionary and me too uh, me too would be like, you sell cheeseburgers, I sell cheeseburgers. Uh, yeah. Evolutionary, I've taken the cheeseburger and I've added lettuce and tomatoes to it. Yeah. And revolutionary, you know, it's no longer a cheeseburger. It's onion rings and fake beef and no everything else. And being yeah. able to figure out where your product is in, in those three categories and mm-hmm. trying to tell that story of how, hey, it's better than a regular cheeseburger because there's a lettuce and tomatoes on it. Yeah, you know, trying to distinguish your product different from from other ones. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, one thing uh, I saw in, in the grocery store a few weeks ago, Oreo on their labeling says uh, 
Milk's favorite cookie, which is funny because Milk cannot talk. Right. But yet they're describing this cookie, which there's other cookies in the cookie aisle. Is saying that this is Milk's favorite choice. If Milk could choose a cookie, it would be the Oreo. Yeah. So they're making a statement that they that they can't even improve. So ethically, I'm not sure if that's a good thing to do or not. I have no idea. But it's still they're making this this point of your attention to Milk's favorite cookie. This claim, magicians make claims all the time, whether or not it's true, not for me to say. Right. But they make this claim and in hopes that you pick it. Mm -hmm. Well, they get your attention. There, there's a marketer that I really like uh, named Roy Williams. Wrote three books, The Wizard of Ads, The Wizard of, uh, they all start with The Wizard of Ads. And they're about, and, and it's one of those great books that you can pick up because it's an article on every page. Mm -hmm. there, there is no through line, but every article is an interesting story or an interesting idea. And one of the first ones he tells is about the way to get someone's attention is to surprise the Broca area of their brain. And the Broca area is the thing that it, it sits inside the ears and it translates words, but it does it partly by expectation. So if I say Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, you mm -hmm. expected all those. But if I say Mary had a little, little lamb, she cut its throat, you know. <laughs> you go, what? I've surprised your Broca's area. It's the same thing that, that Oreo is doing with that. You know, mm. it, it, it's not, it, it, it's, they could have said it's the best, best cookie for dunking in milk, but it's milk's favorite cookie is much better because it surprises you again. And it, it's like that it makes you go, huh? Wait a minute. And yeah. then you think about it. And then they've got a little part of your brain thinking about Oreos for a while. And that's, that the, that's the point. Yeah, it, 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 we're back to the thing of, you know, magicians control attention and attention is the greatest commodity out there today. That's what Google's selling. That's what Facebook is selling. All the biggest companies, you know, maybe without Amazon are selling attention. You're logging in and, you know, who is it? The phrase is if, if you're not paying for the service, you're the product. Very true. You know? Yeah. There's a, a media marketing person who's real big right now, Gary Vaynerchuk. And yeah. one of his catchphrases is I day trade attention because he understands that people go to their phone frequently. You know, he thinks mm -hmm. that the price of TV advertising is overpaid because as soon as a commercial comes on, people go straight to their phones to scroll through Instagram, Facebook, or whatever. Yeah. And he says that's where the, the attention is. So being able to understand where your customer is looking, where that attention is, you can ma manipulate it to your product, to your service, to in the future, they then choose you for whatever it is you're selling. Yeah, exactly. And um, you, know, you were talking a minute ago about the, the three kinds of products. And, and I think David and I are, are and, and, and any successful startup that, that wants to become a mega a, a unicorn is, is looking at that revolutionary mm -hmm. area more than the others, because it's not as much fun to build businesses and compete. If you're not revolutionary, if you're not the underdog, if you're not the disruptor, you know, there for a couple of years, disruption was, was the key to getting mm -hmm. an investment in Silicon Valley. Well, but, but is it really disruptive and how is it disruptive? And, you know, Uber disrupted the taxi industry is a good example. Yeah, I think some of those terms are being you know, inflated and everybody tries to use them. Everybody's an entrepreneur, everybody's a startup. You know, but for those that really have become successful, uh, having that mindset of you know, uh, insurgent thinking or fringe thinking as a startup company, as the underdog, uh, it's, it's been said before, you know, a lot of the big companies from the 1940s and 1950s are no longer the big companies. They're no longer you know, on Dow Jones. Kodak has right. fallen to the wayside. Sears is gone. And the ones that mainly have come up over the past decade are the ones that are taking over you know, the, the marketplace. You know, Uber, Apple, you know, all those other small ones that are coming up. And I wonder how long they're going to last in their top spot until something else comes along. Jeff yeah. Bezos has once told his employees, think about what's next because he knows Amazon will not be around forever. Mm -hmm. Walmart is starting to fall behind. 
And they were the biggest employer you know, in the US at one point. And now Amazon's taken over where Walmart was. I so now I Jeff, Jeff knows what's next beyond Amazon. Yeah. And he's always looking forward, always looking to serve customers. What's the next market? And he wants to make money on everything. I, I like that. He's, yeah, it's like uh, Amazon Web Services started out because they had to have servers to do their thing. Mm-hmm. But we're running these really well. But it's costing us money. It's it's uh, I, I don't see. So so why don't we run it for other people and let them pay us and let them pay for our servers. And now it's a profit center instead of just you know, just a money sink. And he does that everywhere. You know, yeah, so. same thing in real estate. You no, know, why spend the rent on you no know, on a piece of land when you can have somebody else lease it out for you, pay yeah. you and you're they're paying you to own the land. Yeah. Exactly. Incredible. And, uh, but it's, it's all about strategy. So, mm-hmm. so, so, so you, you, you know, we, we started out with, what do you tell somebody to build a business, find a great mission, answer all of those questions, build your unique marketing thing. David calls it a three by five card. I took call it a, your elevator pitch. And it, it basically says the three things that Max Maven tells magicians it says, who are you? What are you doing? Why do we care? Mm-hmm. What's special about it? In 30 seconds or less. And if right. you can't do that, you're not really clear in your own mind about what the business is. So until you get to that point, you're not ready to go out and sell or raise money or any, you know, and, and part of that in, in Silicon Valley is product market fit now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you, you put that minimum viable product the first thing out there just to see if anybody likes it and what they like about it and then you make it better in one way and you test it and you test it and if you're really good and you have the right team in six months you've got a product that goes from we'll give you a dollar to come in off the street and try this product to one where people will download it for free from the app stores, to one where people will pay $5 in the app stores, to one where people will pay $5 a month forever. And and you can see when it hits product market fit, and pe- people investing now know this because it goes from, oh, we have a thousand people and we're building 2% per week to we just built 50% last week, last month. We're, 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 we're going at, you know, two hundred X over the course of every year. And although we're only doing a hundred thousand in business a month this year, if this curve continues this way, we're gonna be at, you know, 150 million next year and a billion the year after. Mm-hmm. Because we found the market and the pain point and the perfect fits fit that people love. And and the, from from then on it's just, you know, marketing, really. Yeah, you're you're getting the feedback from you no know, the, the the those first customers. You're getting social proof from all those reviews, and there's they are what is helping you to develop your product and your service, so it can continue to grow. Absolutely. There's one thing that that you mentioned that triggers something in me. Um, as far as everything communicates, mm. so whenever you're trying to you're pushing out a product, not just you know your mission statement and your vision statement and what your product does and what it's solving. But everything, you're, you're marking, you're advertising, the words you're using in your creatives, your your brand, everything communicates. Your CEO communicates about the, the product, your, your customers communicates to yeah. everything about the product. Um, so that was triggered in me. Um, I didn't know if you had anything about that as far as everything communicates from a business standpoint. I know in, in Magic, we have the ability to control as much as we can in, in, in the theater setting, mm-hmm. lights, the sound, how we stand, are we, is our left side forward, is our right side forward, right. is our hands up, are they down, are we looking at you, through you, are we looking at our left hand, we should be at our right hand. So there's, there's all these things that magicians learn that communicate to the audience. Right. And in, in business, everything communicates you know, as, as well. Um, you know, having your employees wear uniforms versus not wearing uniforms, you know, what kind right. of image does that send? Uh, so with that, I just want to see if there's any additional thoughts you had for that topic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, certainly in, you know, in magic, everything communicates. I, I, I love seeing the magician come out and do the cups and balls with cups with Chinese dragons on them. 
And he never refers to the fact that they're Chinese. He never talks about China. He never refers to anything. Mm. And when it's all over, you know, you want to raise your hand and go, How, tell me about the dragons. He never thought about it. Mm -hmm. But they communicate. Yeah. The, the prop communicates, the, whether it's a metal cup or a wooden cup or a, you know, whatever. And it's all of a picture. And in the theater, you know, every, I, I, I managed theaters for a while. And it makes a difference to the show whether the carpet looks like it's been freshly cleaned or not in the theater. Wow. Everything carpet. communicates. It makes a difference the way the box office answers the phone. That's the beginning of the experience that ultimately ends with your ovation or none. And uh, so every detail makes a difference. And it's the same in business. I, I, I love the, the example. For, I did a workshop at Apple for magicians, not for Apple employees particularly. And uh, drove in and they said, yeah, the, the address is one infinite loop. And if you're, if you're a programmer, you know that an infl infinite loop is one of the biggest problems you can make because it makes your computer hang. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they laugh about it. And they say, yeah, it, it, it was Steve Jobs' joke when he had this place built said, you know, you know what the, 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 the road going into Microsoft is called? And I said, no, one Microsoft way. <laughs> and it w just that little thing encapsulated the difference in the two mm -hmm. companies. One was creative and fast paced and disruptive. And the other was, this is the way we do this. Right. And we did events for them. You, we, I did an event for Microsoft in New Orleans. And uh, one night was in the Superdome. And it was interesting because all of the Microsoft employees came in wearing khakis and the same kind of shirt. Mm -hmm. Wasn't an, a uniform per se. It's just, this is what we do. We're Microsofties. And you go to Apple and you don't know who's an employee and who's a college kid. And, you know, there are people in Indian garb and whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's a completely different attitude and it permeates everything in the company. You know? I know uh, Chick-fil-A is famous for uh, their employees saying, you know, my pleasure instead of you're welcome uh, because the owner heard that from a hotel he was staying in, I believe in, in New York. And it made him feel differently that, yeah. you know, it was, it was the employee's pleasure to help him out as a guest. So he then took that and had all of his employees say it. So whenever you're at Chick-fil-A, they don't say you're welcome. They say, my pleasure. And it's those little things because everything communicates to, to the customer. Absolutely. And, and if you make the right choice, it pleases the customer. Mm -hmm. in, in that moment, that waiter says, my pleasure. And some little part of your subconscious goes, I want to come back here tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And whereas, you know, the wrong thing, does the opposite and you don't even know why I'd, I, I don't even know why I don't like this place, but I don't like this place. Mm. And it, it might be the color of the floor or the, you know, that the tables in a restaurant are left untended or, you know, whatever. But uh, we're, 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 we, we were talking to a woman who's setting up a real estate business in Washington, DC. She said, how do you differentiate yourself? because a real estate agent is a real estate agent and they're all your best friend when they're working for you. And they're all, you know, and it, it, for her, it's coming down to write the story of the best experience you could possibly have, write the story of the worst experience you could possibly have. And, you know, everybody who's bought a house has bad experiences and good experiences. And now write the story of, that transcends all of those experiences and become that, that company, you know, be, become the company that, that knows the best way to find out what you really want and what you can really afford. And that knows where you're going to be uncomfortable. Do you have to go to a mortgage broker or can you just go to your bank? Can they clear it for you? Can they, can they have you fill out one form and then put their researchers on that form? And so that you say, I want this, this, and this, here's my, here's my last paycheck. And they go for you and they pick you up in a limousine and take you to visit three of the perfect places, mm -hmm. you know, or they, they send what, what, what story do you want that client to tell? Right.
and write that story and become that person. You know, that you're, you're talking of story and earlier we talked about scripting and tying scripting in and with everything communicates. Mm -hmm. I think some businesses fail to realize that there is a script to their business and that they can have that written to whatever experience they want the customer to have. Yeah. With, with restaurants, I feel that their menu is their script. And some restaurants just have a very inflated menu of too many options and the customer gets overwhelmed. Yeah. And having somebody come in and you know, redo their script and lean it out some, they can then provide a more concise experience for their, their customer. And so on, on the you know, back end of that, you were just describing how you told you know, the real estate agent to write out you know, the best experience and worst experience and be able to communicate that. So I think with being able to script your business in whatever uh, industry you're in, you're able to control that dialogue. You're able to focus your customer's attention. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you're able to, you know, as we just mentioned, everything communicates. You know, you're able to focus on what kind of furniture should we have? Should we have real trees, fake trees? You know, how should we answer the phone? I've yeah. worked in places where it's scripted and it's on the phone. Whenever you answer, you say this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so I'm curious about what your thoughts are as far as scripting uh, in, in, in a business sense. I think it's important. I, I read somewhere, this was a number of years ago, they said, well, you're in the entertainment business, which means you're in every business. Every business is entertainment today. Mm -hmm. Certainly any, any consumer business. And uh, an example, I remember I bought my iPad. When I, when I first bought an iPad, I bought it from a friend who worked at Apple. And he had a script he had to take me through to buy my iPad. And part of that script was... You know, the, all, all the stuff you would expect, how, how much memory, such and such, can you afford this? I think you need this. You don't need that. Mm -hmm. You need this. And, and then there came to a, a place where, and what would you the, like the inscription to be on your iPad? So I hadn't thought about that. Wow. I, I never expected to be asked that for mm -hmm. when I was buying a tech. Well, well we, we inscribe them if, if people want it. And I, I think it's a good idea. Okay. And I, I think I did... Um, uh, a, a sufficiently advanced technology referring to the Arthur Clarke thing. Mm -hmm. And, and he got, you know, he recommended one thing cause he used one. And then a week after I placed the order, I got an email from Apple saying your iPad is, is on the assembly line right now. Mm -hmm. And your inscription will be added tomorrow morning. And we expect it to be shipped tomorrow night from our plant in China. And then three weeks or a week later, I got one saying, your iPad is arriving at the port of Los Angeles today and should be delivered to you on such and such a day. Please let us know when it arrives and how you feel about it. And then it comes and it's in a beautiful blue box that looks like a Tiffany box with ribbon and you open it and there's, they've scripted the entire experience from the moment I said, I'd like to buy an iPad until I turn it on. You know, it's not just selling me an iPad. It's selling me an experience that makes me feel like, wow, I must be somebody because right. they are really fussing over me. And that's, that, that's an interesting message to get. You know, you, you don't get that, that message when you walk into Best Buy. Yeah, I think the businesses that are able to get their customer excited for waiting for a product or to be excited at home when they don't even have it, you know, yeah. are those that can go far. Um, having been to the Magic Castle several times, uh, for those that haven't been, it's, it's a magician-only club. Guests can, can be invited. However, it's a coat and tie type place. Uh, ladies have to wear an evening attire type of, of outfit. Right. And in L.A., it is a very L.A. thing to go do. It's, it's a thing to know somebody who can get you tickets and go in. And there's this whole buildup of you've got the tickets. And now you're waiting for that date to come because you have to eat dinner and go and go see shows. And then 
oh, now you have to get dressed up. So it was a very special thing. And then you drive up and now there's this big castle in downtown Los Angeles. And then you're waiting you know, in, in, the, in the foyer to go in. And then you say these magic words and the door slides open. So there's all this thing, there's this whole buildup before you even go that yeah. makes it even more exciting. Uh, Stephen Cohen in uh, New York for his, uh, his show, Mm -hmm. it's, it's the same way where you have to buy a ticket, you're, you're dressing up, there's this anticipation to where you're excited about a magic show you haven't even gone to, and it's two weeks away. Yeah, absolutely. So again, is it controlling that entire experience from the time they place the order until the time they receive it and they experience it? Yeah. And I think more and more businesses, I, I think that's the level that business is going to have to compete at in the future. And I think some people are scared to be that creative or they don't think that they are that creative mm -hmm. and most people are if they just take an extra 15 minutes to think through something yeah. they will discover that they can write this whole thing out they can write this experience for the customer out but i think Absolutely. too many are just like i have a product and i want to sell it yeah. so i'm going to have a website and put it out there sure or create an app and that's it and and that can work, you know. There there's there's relational marketing, there's transactional marketing, there is. I I like I I tell all my clients in performance, forget transactions. They're great if you just want to sell a ticket to one show, and if you're only going to do one show, that's fine. But if you if you're a corporate magician, you don't want to work for Hewlett Packard once. Mm -hmm. You want to work for eight event eight events a year. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to hire you for eight events unless you build a good reputation with mm -hmm. them and good relationships with their people and, you know, over deliver whenever you can. We're, we're, we're doing, you know, the, our, our, our tagline at the McBride Magic and Mystery School this year is over deliver, pivot and over deliver. There is a need out there and we're doing, we're seeing probably three or four times as many students as we mm -hmm. used to because we've pivoted to, to doing everything online until we can do live again. Yeah. But if you do it on live, you can do it for a, a lower price. Cause I can do two classes a day. People used to have to travel here and we'd spend three days with them and then they travel home. Right. And now they can sit at their desk and do a two hour class for a hundred dollars that used to be 600. Yeah. And yeah. we can serve, 30 people in a class where we only had 15 people fit in the rooms at Jeff's house. So, you know, it's, it's a different business, but you have to, you, you have to control the whole experience. We spend time building community. We spend time approaching people before, once they sign up for a class, they get a certain kind of a message. Mm -hmm. uh, once the class is on, they get another one. And when the class is almost over, they realize that not only did I get this six hours of teaching, which is recorded and I can see it, but Tobias just threw in, threw in a free copy of his book and David threw in a free copy of his book and Jeff threw in three two hour videos. And I've, I've got work to do on this class for two months after the class is over because mm -hmm. you want to over deliver. You want people to go, wow, I can't believe you delivered so much for so little. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, it's taking some, you know, uh, new insurgent companies to change the ways other companies are behaving. Uh, we mentioned Uber you know, recently. Yeah. And with Uber, you're excited to wait for your car to show up because you can track your car. And now right. other companies are doing that. I know I had a Sears guy come out last week to fix the oven, and I could see where my Sears guy was on his way here. So yeah. it's over delivering because customers, I think now, they, they want that. They didn't know that they could have that, right. but now they can't. Where I can see where my repair guy is. I can see where my Uber car is. Exactly. No, and then also you mentioned pivoting. Right now, I think is is a critical time for businesses across industries that how they adapt to these current times will determine how successful they'll be in the past. Mm -hmm. Magicians, I think, have been very good as far as pivoting and taking technology and being the first at it. We talked briefly as far as magicians being the first in in film and, and movie. Uh, yeah. Even uh, even up to the iPhone, the first app that was developed gave the illusion you were drinking beer from your phone. Right. Uh, so I think in this current time, 
if if you can't pivot, if you're unable to, just because you think this is a fad, this is a phase that's going to pass, mm-hmm. you're going to be caught behind the power curve and you may not ever be able to catch up. So being creative, I know that in, in the magic community, there are some magicians that's, I'll just wait it out. This is a short oh, thing. Yeah. Coronavirus will go away in a few months. You know, that was February, March timeframe. And now we're in September. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, maybe I'll do a Zoom show. Yeah. And for those that haven't performed in front of a camera, it's it's different. Very. And I know for me, it took me several shows of mm. what works as far as material wise, lighting. I now now I'm learning blocking and lighting and all these yeah. other things I never thought I would have to learn because I'm so used to performing live. Absolutely. But you know, having to pivot in, in this current time will not only create new industries uh, and new opportunities, is survival. Yeah. Exactly. It it really is innovator die time, you know, and which which it always was. It was just slower. Yeah, it's, I I think the whole pandemic and everything has just accelerated change that was about to happen anyway. Mm-hmm. But now you have to. It's like there there are a few magicians there. You know, I I, I see my friend Paul Draper, Alex Ramon, people like that. They're doing six or eight shows a week where they used to do one or two. Mm -hmm. Paul had one day when he did six shows in one day. Yeah, I know that. You know, yeah. Paul put something on his Facebook as far as what his day was like and all the interviews and phone calls and shows. And I compared his day to my day. Like, what did I do wrong? Uh, So, yeah, so I'm always impressed whenever I hear people doing so many shows, Zoom shows especially, uh, within a week or a day. I mean, I've had... I've been lucky to where I've done you know, a couple a day, but that's just because the crowd was so huge. I didn't want so many people on one Zoom show, so I broke it up. Mm-hmm. I've done yeah. a, a couple a week. And, uh, but yeah, just incredible that you know, magicians are still able to go out there and find the work, knowing that it's, it's exciting to me because I know it does exist. Companies are hiring magicians. People are still hiring magicians. Absolutely. So you know, I'm excited to hear that people are hiring magicians. I'm just sad it's not me. Sure. Yeah, and uh, but a lot of it is, it's the same thing. Who are you serving? What is? It, what are their pain points? Mm-hmm. And you already have clientele. They just have different pain points than they did six months ago. Very much so. They, yeah. And and they still need to function. They still need to gather their team. They need to inspire people. They need to do all those things that they used to hire us to do. But now you have to do it on this platform or on you know. Microsoft meet, uh, micro, yeah, Microsoft Teams or Google Meetings mm-hmm. or whatever, but it's online, and we communicate differently online than we do live. We do. Um, I, I did a, a live event uh, a few days ago over, over the weekend, yeah. and it took me a little while to get to switch mindsets from performing online to oh, this is in person now, just right. because you do so many shows online, you're thinking about the material for it, how to, how to interact with the camera. Now you're in front of people, at least for me in ways, it took me a moment to be like, okay, I'm in front of people. This is what I do in front of people rather than in front of a camera. Sure. Absolutely. So uh, you've written several books as far as presentations and performing. Uh, So one thing I want to ask you, what are some some tips and advice you have for people that give presentations, especially dry material? Uh, I've been in the military. I'm still in the military, and I have to give some annual training lectures sometimes and it's some of the driest material ever and right. imagine we talk about hooking the audience and engaging with them uh so so what, what are some ideas and tips you have for people that give presentations uh a few months ago i had to give a presentation on on, on the summertime summer in the military is real big for us accidents and people are outside playing sports and they're they burn themselves on fireworks and grills uh, mm-hmm. so i did this emotional hook of Okay, think back to when you were a kid and your summers and you were traveling and you had vacations, maybe it was a car ride, and you want to share that with your children today. So, and then this whole thing as far as being safe and things of that nature. Uh, So that was my attempt was trying to emotionally hook the audience into this training event of being safe. Uh, So so what's some thoughts that you have on that? Um, It always goes back to story. How can you make it a story? It, it's one thing to say, this grill is hot, don't put your hand on it, you'll burn it. It's another one, 
to tell a joke and show somebody put their hand on the grill and jumps around and screams and you know or or to tell a story that's heartstring pulling mm -hmm. and uh, it, it always comes back to turn it into a story if you can data is data and nobody's excited about data except actuaries you know <laughs> and uh, are there any stage setting tips if i'm using that term correctly to help enhance the uh presentation as far as any lighting or maybe setting the stage quote unquote whether it's a, you know a whiteboard or a projection screen or things of that nature in office lighting absolutely I, I i think the the control attention comes back again and again um when, when i work with presentation clients either live or whatever too many put, people will work with PowerPoint and put up a complicated slide, a chart that has four lines on it, and the blue one is this, and the red one is this, and there's 18 data points. And the entire time that slides up, I'm trying to decipher, decipher the slide, and I'm not listening to the person. Whereas if yeah. they say something and they put up the slide, and notice this, this, and this about the slide, and then they take it down, or they zoom in on just the part of it they want to talk about. You can guide a person, guide people's intention, attention. Mm -hmm. And the minute you fail to tell them where to look and what to listen to, you lose them. You confuse them. And once you confuse them, it takes two minutes to get them back on the train that you want want to get them. Um, the other thing is, you know, every presentation. People take away three things from a presentation. What are the three things you want them to take away? And that kind of goes back to your purpose. I want to get them from here, where they're not sure they want to buy a car at all, to over here, where they got to have their Mercedes. Mm -hmm. What are the three steps that will get them from here to here? That's all the talk should be. You know, it shouldn't be stories that go off on tangents. It should be this story leads to this story, leads to this story. And now you know why you absolutely, why it's, the best investment you could possibly make in your own future is to bite the bullet and buy this Mercedes or whatever it is. Right. You know, but it's like, but if you don't know what the purpose is, if you don't know the starting point, the ending point, you don't know the path to get there. Mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 it's like the Cheshire cat asking Alice. She, she comes to the fork on the road and says, which one should I take? He says, where do you want to go? I, I don't know much. Then it doesn't really matter, does it? True. You know? And, yes, uh, uh, going back to the, the PowerPoint slides, there was an exercise I heard of where the end goal is to get your slide down to a picture. Mm -hmm. So you may start with two paragraphs. Okay, then from there you go down to some, some bullet points. And right. then just a few words to a word to a picture and now you're briefing just off of the picture yeah. because you don't need that as a reference anymore exactly. it's your ability to to communicate your topic without the actual aid of a powerpoint mm -hmm. absolutely and the best the the best talks don't use a powerpoint or use it very sparingly mm -hmm. I, I every now and then i'll go back and on youtube and watch steve jobs keynotes and he had great slides. It was just gray most of the time behind him. But when he said, you know, and, and last month we broke 1 billion in sales. Mm -hmm. Do you know what that looks like? And the number 1 billion filled the stage mm -hmm. with all the zeros. And it was up there long enough and he looked at it and he went, feels pretty good, doesn't it? And it came down. Right. And it was a masterful moment, you know, um, mm -hmm. which you know, he, he brings up another thing. Um, People think they can wing it for a presentation. If it's an important presentation, don't wing it. He always looked absolutely casual and like he was just coming off the cuff. He rehearsed five days with a team of five directors for every talk he ever gave like that. To yep. make it look like it was off the cuff and casual, but he was such a showman, you know. Yeah, I remember when Apple would travel to do, to do their keynotes they would show up a week early and they're in there rehearsing, you know, yeah. every day. You know, I'm sure now with their, you know, uh, convention center being on campus, you know, I can't imagine how much time they can actually put in now. Yeah. And even their last WWDC, which was a recorded event, it was still incredible. Yeah. Always. Mm-hmm.
every every attention to detail. And he was a showman. Yeah. He he would lead you on and oh, there's something coming, but I can't tell you about it yet. Or there is one you last know, thing. Yeah, and and always, oh, just just one more thing. Yes. One more thing. Yeah. And uh, and the people who knew it, who had been there before, couldn't wait for the one last thing. Mm -hmm. You know. And, and the other people who worked equally well, but it was beautifully scripted. Even it the was. little off the cuff things were scripted, mm -hmm. you know. And they're great entertainers, comedians, actors, magicians, who, if they do it right, even the moments that you see in their show that you think only happened because you were there on that particular night for that particular mm -hmm. show, or else you wouldn't have seen it, it's right. scripted. It is Absolutely. in there. Absolutely. And Absolutely. those that can pull it off to make you think, oh, if I wasn't here, I was going to miss it. Incredible. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I don't know if you've seen Jeff perform that much, but he does a miser's dream with a kid from the audience that he calls a sorcerer's apprentice. That's mm -hmm. a totally silent piece. He makes a hero of the kid. Oh, and real quick, just for those who don't understand yeah. what Miser's Dream is, it is a um, magic trick or magic defect where the magician has the ability to pull coins, to pull money out of air at random and at will. Absolutely. And and they wind up in a bucket. And in, in Jeff's version, he shows how it works and he has the kid imitate him. And eventually the kid grabs a coin and releases it and it rings in the bucket. So the kid has become the magician. Mm -hmm. And the kid always responds huge, and Jeff causes them to, re you know, the audience doesn't know that he is manipulating them to the degree he is. But every time I, 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 whenever I meet somebody who saw one of his shows, they say, oh yeah, I was there the night when that kid broke him up. Mm -hmm. And my response is, oh wow, you saw a great show that night, huh? Because he, the kid breaks him up every night. It's in the script. Yeah. The kid doesn't know it's in the script, but Jeff does. And the audience loves it. But it's one of those moments, you know. Yeah. And uh, and so, they love it because it feels totally spontaneous. And it wouldn't mm -hmm. if it wasn't rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed. And a lot of times, a lot of those moments start as an accident. That yeah. the magician or the entertainer realizes, oh, that's a funny moment. They right. take note of that and then write it into the show. Yeah. Absolutely. Matt King has a moment in his show where a woman selects a card and signs it. Mm -hmm. And she's supposed to sign it on the face. But she signs it on the back and then he's going to find it. And she puts it back and he goes, wait. Oh, I guess I didn't say you had to sign it on the face. I'm not going to have much trouble finding that one now. And it's the way he sets it up. It gets a laugh. It was an accident the first mm -hmm. time. You know, and, and Tana sent a you know, presentation. I remember back in high school, I was giving a, a talk in, in health class. And so so this part is trying to connect on how you can script accidents into a presentation to make it a little f funnier, more lively. Yeah. Uh, we were doing a, a health presentation, and I told the teacher, hey, I need my partner to go out of the room, so and he's going to come in and, and do something. And she said, okay. Then as he leaves, he trips and falls. Yeah. And everybody laughs at him. But the whole mm -hmm. point of that was the way he fell, he could have hurt his arm or his shoulder or something, which is a kind of a break yeah. or a kind of whatever. So we scripted in a fall to illustrate how he could have broken a bone. That's great. So again, just spend the extra 15 minutes and you'll mm -hmm. discover that there is creativity that you do have or that your partner may have mm -hmm. to make a presentation that is dry and boring on health topics or whatever. And it can be more, more exciting and more lively than just pure facts. Absolutely. And you know, people think, oh, I'm creative or I'm not creative or I don't feel inspired today. But the truth is, you can jumpstart your creativity. There are lots of things you can do to become creative. You can, you know, one of the things we, we do is, you know, what's the opposite of this? How would I kill this company? Um, there are questions you can ask yourself that will force you to be creative. And uh, anybody, mm -hmm. you know, we, we do a thing with the matrix where for, for this is for magicians, but you could do it with products where I have three effects I want to learn. I want to learn the card that rises to the top. I want to learn an ace assembly. I want to learn to produce a change of silk's color, whatever. 
You say, great, those, those, those are your effects. Now list 10 things that you love to do when you're not doing magic. Oh, I like to ski, I like to ride horses, I love to go to the movies, I whatever it is. Great, okay. And now list five of your favorite fictional characters. And I like Yogi Bear, I like Iron Man, I like, you know, whoever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay, now you've got a matrix. Now, put your pen on one of the tricks, close your eyes and make a squiggle. And now they have, I'm going to do color changing silks as Yogi Bear while on skis. Mm -hmm. I'm a creative person. If I can create that piece of magic, I've created something that's totally unique to me. And now I have to figure out how to do that, how to make those things go together. And you're creating. Yeah, you weren't inspired. You weren't, you know, you just took things you already knew and mixed them up. And I think that will lead me to, to this point as far as having a team. Uh, you've worked mm -hmm. in, in theaters and done all the shows and, and mm -hmm. writing. And you just talked about it an example of having a team to help expand your creativity. So in your experience, how important has collaboration and teams been? Tremendously. Be because the team does that thing that you don't think of. Um, and it's sometimes something as simple as, you know, you're at dinner discussing business and somebody spills a salt shaker. And you go, oh, that's just like that thing that happened in the office the other day. And... I wonder how if, if, if we could make the salt shaker so it couldn't spill, we could make that thing so it never happened again either. And it's the interaction, the back and forth that that inspires everybody to get bigger, to have bigger ideas, to, you know, we all have different boxes that we think in. And so if we can mix your box and my box and somebody else's box up together and pour them all out, we get something different that no one of us ever would have come up with. Yeah, I know that Bill Gates and Steve Jobs famously had retreats where they would go away with their with some of the top employees and executive teams and they yeah. spend time creating. Google allows, I think, 20% of employees' time to just do whatever it is that they want to do to just be creative. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's historical examples of having teams and allowing time for creativity mm -hmm. will pay off huge dividends in, in the future. Absolutely. There, there's a company I read on a book about crowdsourcing. I think it's called Innocentive. And it basically is a clearinghouse for um, big corporations, small corporations. Anybody can submit a project and say, we offer a prize of $50,000 to who can solve this. Mm -hmm. Because it's cheaper to do that than to set up a big lab and hire five scientists and do this and that. And then you can go to their website and say, oh, they have this project and, oh, I know how to do that. And they said something like 60% of their projects get solved by people outside the discipline. Wow. The chemistry project gets solved by a carpenter who says, well, Amazing. you know, just, just, just use a level. Or yeah. bubbles, you know, or just do this, and uh, that you you get so much value. And w one of the problems we have in society is everybody specializes. Mm -hmm. So the doctor who knows heart surgery doesn't know how to tell you what to eat, and and the nutritionist doesn't know how to set an arm if you break an arm. And the you know we're so specialized that the information doesn't cross pollinate yeah. enough and we're not creative enough. Yeah. So the one last thing I want to touch on uh, is this concept of the inner magician. The magician's catchphrase of abracadabra means I create as I speak. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, a lot of people that have great ideas and they don't, they're unable to fulfill those ideas and dreams, but being able to know what you want, being able to speak into the world, and as a magician, use their tools and props around them to make it happen. If you picture the tarot card of the magician, he's pointing a wand and he's surrounded by, by his props. Well, the wand isn't doing anything. It's focusing his energy to make whatever happened happen. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of 
business owners and entrepreneurs that they start off with that inner magician of knowing I want this business, I want this product, I want this service. Mm-hmm. And over time, it, it fails out. They forget to to rekindle that that fire that they had of this passion for their, their product and their business. Uh, so just any thoughts you had as far as the inner magician or rekindling that inner magician? Yeah, absolutely. Um, part of it goes back to, you, you mentioned earlier, the lean startup thing where you, you create a product and go. Um, one of my favorite books is The Art of the Start, Guy, Guy Kawasaki. He says, make, make meaning, make something and get going. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, it, it's um, something mantra and get going. But basically, you, you, you create your reason for doing it. You create the thing that inspires you and your clients, and then you start. And you don't wait until you have the perfect team, and you don't wait until you have, you know, everything in line to start. Because the people that wait are the ones who never start, mm. or who, you know, and uh, where was I going with that? Um, oh, the other part of that is. You don't, it doesn't have to be perfect. It, it is the lean startup, the minimum mm. viable product. My friend George Parker teaches something he calls the survival method. And that, his, his, his example is a really good one. He asks somebody, what's your fondest dream? Well, I would like to take my kids to the Sahara Desert and camp under the stars where we could see all of the starlight with no such and such. It happened to me, my grandfather took me there when I was five years old and I've never been able to do it. Well, why haven't you done it? Well, I can't afford it, I can't take the time off, such and such. Okay, you have the kids, right? So you're, you're part way there. You have a backyard. Do you have a sandbox in the backyard? Do your kids know how to play make-believe? Could you, could you go set up a tent in front of the sandbox tonight? Mm-hmm and say, let's pretend we're in the Sahara Desert and go sit in the sandbox with them and look at the stars and tell the stories your grandfather told you. And now you have fulfilled that dream. Was it what you expected? Is it worth now saying, okay, we're gonna work together and make the real Sahara thing happen? Or it wasn't it, because not, not you know, failure is okay. Failure mm-hmm. is an option. That, that's one of my favorite um, Elon Musk quotes. It says failure is an option here. As a matter of fact, if you don't fail, you're not trying hard enough. You're not innovating hard enough. Uh, don't think of it as failure with stigma. Think of it as an experiment to find out, will this work? Is this what I'm excited about? If I do it, does it give me the sensation that I thought it would or my customers that sent? And if it doesn't, move on. Get right. another dream. Yeah, you know, you every- just talked about expectations and... You know, he wanted a certain experience, but his children weren't aware of that end result. And magicians, we, we use that a lot to where we know how it's supposed to end. We don't tell you. So that gives us all these outs or backup plans that we can use. Yeah. They'll satisfy your, your, your need for you no know, entertainment and, and, and mystery. Mm-hmm. I think there's, there's too many of us that we have the expectation and we're trying to fulfill that when it's not the other person's expectation. Absolutely. And and sometimes that just means you have to have a bigger expectation. True. It's like it doesn't matter if if they actually said ace of spades when I wanted them to. Maybe they said the three of hearts. Mm-hmm. And they never know that I just totally changed had to change direction in my show to make the three of hearts come up. Or, or maybe yeah, somebody I know of, Kenton Knepper does this. He has people choose cards, and it's never just choose a card. So which one did you, I got the three of, oh, I love the three of hearts. That shows a person that's such and such and this and that. And maybe he's doing a trick with the three of hearts, or maybe he goes on to the next person. Let's see what you get until he gets what he wants. The audience never knows it went off track. They've had a great time. They've gotten a free reading. He is connected with someone. And they don't know that, you know, that card was supposed to be another card or something. So, but the overall effect is we had a magical experience together. This guy said he was going to do this. And along the road, he took us here and he took us there and he took us there. And we wound up having this experience. Wow. 
And yeah, I, I think it has Apple, a bigger image of what that is, what it has to be. Mm -hmm. I think Apple does a good job of, they have ideas of where they want to go. I think mm -hmm. those that dig into the code, they kind of get some sort of inkling feeling of what's about to happen. Right. But they don't say anything because if it doesn't happen, nobody's disappointed except for them. So as, as the consumer, right. now if they told me they're coming out with an Apple car and then they don't, I'm disappointed. Right. But if it's just rumors and, and it's all just so they can have a better radio or the, the Apple right. CarPlay, then I'm fine with that. Right. They're very much like magicians who want to keep their secrets. Very much so. You know, I've, I've spent a fair amount of time, not at the new campus, but at the old one, which is also a big circle and things. And all the time you're there, you see people hauling through things through the halls with covers on them. And right. you, know, you, you can know what department Bob worked down the hall works in, but you won't know the project he's working on exactly. Mm -hmm. And he can't tell you he could be fired if he did tell you. Oh, yeah. You know? So they're, so they're like magicians. And it's partly for the reason you just, you just you know, mentioned, is that we don't want to disappoint you. We want to surprise you and delight you. Mm -hmm. It's not just surprise, it's delight. Not all surprises are good. But delight is always good. Exactly. You know? and, and surprise is part of it. So they're, they're the same way. You know? yeah. Well, Tobias, I appreciate your time today. Uh, is there anything you want to plug before we go? Um, not really. If this was going out right away, I would love to plug my, my acting for, for magicians class on, uh, the McBride magic school it starts in two weeks and kind of some of it, it's not about business, but everything's connected in certain ways. It's about taking that fascination that we've had as magicians and saying, guess what? You're an entertainer and I can take that trick that you might be doing perfectly and turn it into great entertainment and something that you're going to have more fun doing and your audiences are going to love more because it's going to have connections with the audience. It's going to have story. It's going to have all the things that a great actor can provide that you don't know how to provide yet. Mm -hmm. And it's, 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 it's a fun class. It's a workshop. We do silly things. It's also about creativity. We, we okay. do things like, okay, you, you can do the linking rubber bands. Great, you can do it and you have a script. Now let's do it to rap music and change the movements. Now, okay, that was great. Now let's do it to Mozart string quartets. And it becomes a totally different piece. Oh, and sure. again, we're, we're inspiring our own creativity and finding new ways to do it. So it's going to be a fun class. It goes on three weeks and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, Shop.magicalwisdom.com, you'll find it. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I'll be sure to put the links uh, in, the, in the episode notes. So for those that are looking for more of of all the books you've done and everything else that you have going on, all the projects and workshops, uh, all the links will be in that. Fantastic. So, uh, yeah, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nolan. This was fun. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye.